Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Linda Strauss. She's an adjunct professor at UC San Diego, where she teaches human nutrition. She's also the president of EI Ventures and Silly.com. Those two companies are really interesting because they're working on two different angles of psychedelics. One of them is an actual synthetic compound that people could be prescribed and the other is psychedelic assisted therapy that would happen inside of virtual reality. You may recognize the name Strauss. You may also recognize the name EI Ventures and Silly.com because I interviewed Dr. Strauss's son, Tyler, several episodes ago. If you haven't listened to that episode yet and you want to learn more about psychedelics and his experience and why it's so difficult to understand what it is and what someone's experience with psychedelics is like, then go listen to that episode, Tyler Strauss. With Dr. Linda Strauss, I'm going to be talking about the FDA and what they look for in trials, what different phases there are in drug trials, and just how crazy you have to be to start a trial, how, you know, how much time it takes, how much money it takes, all of the things that could go wrong. And then from there, we get a little bit deeper into psychedelics as a whole, how society is changing and its attitude towards psychedelics are changing and what we think the future of psychedelics looks like in the United States and beyond. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Strauss, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Linda Strauss. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. you for taking the time to talk with me. You're the first scientist I would say I've spoken to uh, on the podcast. So I'm fascinated to hear more about the clinical trial process. Probably most people aren't thinking that, but I think every aspect of entrepreneurship is important and science is entrepreneurship. I agree. And thank you for inviting me. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your career and what you're doing right now? I have a PhD in biochemistry and physiology and I believe at one part of my lifetime, I thought I would stay in academics forever. So I did the standard, you know, go get your PhD, go back to the university as a postdoc. I actually continued at the university for quite some time, became a research scientist, and eventually moved into doing clinical research into humans, which in an academic center with a PhD rather than an MD forced me just to make decisions in my life. I pivoted, if you will, and went into drug development. I did retain a faculty appointment at the University of California in San Diego. I currently teach and have taught for quite a long time a human nutrition course to undergraduates, um, which is a lot of fun. It's a great little part of my life. The rest of my life has been in the life sciences and drug development, where I oversaw the conduct of very large scale clinical trials, which is what we're going to focus on today. And as a result of a personal journey, my husband was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is incurable brain cancer, in April of 2008. He died of that disease two years later. There's always impacts in our life that uh, force those pivot points and change the path we're on. And so I pivoted and joined my two sons in uh, the botanical space. We develop cannabidiol CBD products made out of hemp. And through that journey, fell into the psychedelic space where we consulted for almost two years and I'm currently working with EI Ventures to develop a psychedelic molecule for FDA approval. 
you were talking about your husband's experience with this cancer and how it brought you into CBD and all of that. What was it specifically about that that got you interested? First of all, glioblastoma, and I apologize to you and anybody listening, is incurable brain cancer. It's an intrinsic cancer, so it actually doesn't leave your brain. It sounds sort of like good news, but it's really not. And there are no cures. The survival is like 1% survive over five years. So it's the same disease, by the way, that Ted Kennedy died of, that Bo Biden died of, and most recently, John McCain. It's sort of gotten a little spotlight, if you will, based on the individuals. Uh, my husband and I, his name was Randy. You know, we grew up in the 60s, and I can leave it just as that. So using marijuana at the time was recreational, as we like to, to say today. And I think what shifted was we began to see a benefit. So shifting that mentality, I actually tell this story a lot, because when you grew up in the 60s, smoking a joint and going to a party or going to a movie was what we did. And when you change the focus to use that substance, use that therapy, use that medicine as a medicinal product, you have to shift. And it used to be funny when our two sons did move home for the last six months of their dad's life. And, you know, there were times that they would work with their dad and say, you know, this will help with sleep, which it did, nausea and appetite due to both the chemotherapy he was on as well as the disease itself, um, lack of sleep. I will never tell anybody how detrimental that is to your overall wellness, especially when it's chronic lack of sleep. But it would be funny because they'd go, hey, dad, you know, I rolled you a joint, just take a couple hits off of it, then we'll try to eat something or something. And he'll go, hey, Linda, do you want to have a hit? And I go, uh, no, I'm sort of still working today. You know, but it was that shift of getting him to understand that this wasn't to get high. This was to help him sleep, to decrease his anxiety. And I can tell you, it was a game changer, especially for symptom management, for sleep and anxiety. And all of us can take a pause in our life and sort of try to think of what our brain and minds would be doing if you knew you were dying and how that would change every single aspect of your life. I'm sorry you had to go through that. I've spoken to other people before who their loved ones have had cancer while they're running a business or some of their family members died while they were running businesses. So I, I've i never had to experience this myself, but hearing other people go through it, it never gets easier and I hope that I never have to deal with that myself. And I do too. So through all of that, you guys got into the psychedelics. What was it that got you from CBD to that? Sometimes as they say, things just happen. The co-founder and CEO of EI Ventures, um, the parent company to EI Ventures is a company called Orthogonal Thinker. It's really a holding company that acquires and grows by joint ventures, acquisitions. And so we have um, actually met David Nixad a long, long time ago after we started Randy's Club. So that was at least eight, nine years ago now. And he helped us as Randy's Club grew and we became a part of the orthogonal holdings. And so what caused us to shift at that moment in time was really their shift into the psychedelics. Um, the psychedelic industry in many ways is mirroring the cannabis space. Um, I'm sure it will diverge. I see a lot more activity on the regulated pathway, whereas cannabis has clearly taken the adult use pathway with very few products that have moved into that space with Epidiolex being the exception to the rule. It is a now an FDA approved drug for the treatment of rare pediatric epilepsies called Darvets and LG. And it was developed and um, is marketed by GW Pharmaceuticals. And it was created from the marijuana plant. But with the exception of that, we haven't seen this landslide of cannabis products, cannabis drugs going through the FDA regulated pathway. On the other hand, we have quite a lot of studies that are now opening up looking at psychedelics. We have MAPS with ketamine. We have MDMA that's going to end up in front of the FDA. And of course, we have a number of psilocybin products um, probably 
Compass Pathways is at the forefront right now. I've been spending a lot of time researching psilocybin and trying it and, you know, helping my mom with her own issues. And my dad and my brother also have their own issues. So we, we've all been kind of trying it. And of course, for, for me, it's not about getting high. Like I think I, I look at it more of a scientist and as a person who with a background in psychology, I understand my own issues. And so I feel like psilocybin is a fantastic thing to help people with anxiety, depression, whatever uh, they have that's ailing them. So I'm a huge proponent of this space, and I wish I was in a situation where I could be investing in it. Well, investing in it is one thing. You ought to, you know, there are clinical trials going on to our discussion point and bringing full circle. I think David approached uh, myself and my two sons as subject matter experts, but he came to me because I understand the FDA process. I have the connections. You know, nobody knows everything. As you grow up and work in whatever industry you work in, it's probably the most important thing for you to understand is that, you know, is what you do know and what you don't know and how to reach out to those people. So my network in drug development after over 35 years is pretty broad. If I don't know anything, but if I, you know, need something, I can go and reach out and I have those connections to make it happen. It's been a press release. It's publicly announced that we are at EI Ventures are working with a contract research organization to develop a transdermal psilocybin patch ultimately. And the process is long and arduous and, you know, you have to go through the testing and the animal testing and the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic testing all before you even walk into, quote, clinical trials in humans. It definitely sounds like something you'd have to be insane to try, (laughs) but I think it's really important What's interesting is that I believe most, if not all of the drugs on the market today have come from a plant or a fungi or something from nature. Yes, biologics have. They've figured out how to synthesize it in a way that we can take the benefits of something. There's been things like um, metformin, like they said it's supposed to be for your heart, but then they realized like actually it extends the life of mice. You can't test everything for everything, nor can you test everything forever. So... When things move through the process and they get approved by the FDA, based on the studies that were conducted, that dictates the label. Um, A fun thing for your listeners to do, I taught a course, Clinical Trials 101, for a master's program in regulatory affairs, you know, quite a few years ago. And we had to come up with a project. I was co-teaching it with a colleague of mine. And so the project we came up with was to go into your proverbial medicine cabinet and pick anything that's there that came with a prescription and has what we call an insert in it. You know, you you take it out, it's got, you need a magnifying glass today to read it, but it's got all that fine print there and you're supposed to read it all. Now you can do it online. They're called package inserts. If you read that package insert, you could write an entire drug development pathway for that product because who it's indicated for were all the inclusion exclusion criteria that were there. All the side effects were all the adverse events that were collected during the conduct of that study. And you can go on and on. So if it says you have to be, you know, over 18, you know, what are your symptoms? This is for the treatment of. These are called claims. And unless you run controlled clinical trial that demonstrates safety and efficacy, you can't put a claim on your products. So there's one great thing that people can do. They can pick anything out, and when they read it, just take a little different approach to reading that. Just don't go, oh, shit, look at all these side effects. But really think that it also tells me who I am, what my symptoms are. It says everything on that package insert. How often do you take it? That was the study design. The subject came in, they took the pill, you know, twice a day for five days and then off for two whatever, that's exactly how that clinical trial was conducted. On the other hand, go open your multivitamin. You're not going to find a package insert in there. And if it's marketed correctly, it's not going to say, take vitamin, you know, B12 and have more, you know, whatever, produce more energy or whatever. Vitamin C will not have a label that says it cures the common cold because it doesn't. You were talking about the things that you have to do before you can do a clinical trial. So in a preclinical situation, How do you get started if you want to do something like that? 
I like to take it down to something that's meaningful and, and in some ways easy to understand because it impacts us. So when you go to the doctor and they give you a prescription, you go fill your prescription, Lipitor. I don't care what it is. Every time you get your refill, you never think, well, I wonder if it's the same as I got last time. It doesn't even enter your mind. And that is the essence of preclinical. The FDA wants to know that every time you make this product, whatever it is, biologic, new chemical entity, even a medical device, combination products, the list goes on and on. Every time you make that, it's going to be the same. So you have to demonstrate what's called chemistry, manufacturing, and controls. That every time the chemistry is the same, that you can run it through good manufacturing practices, GMP, and the end product based on your parameters will always be the same. They expect that, as they should, right? Because we all just go, yeah, I'd hope so. But we don't really think about it. I want to come back to that, but I do want to point out that we also have to do animal models, and there's clear guidances for animal models. You have to use you know, rats and mice, and then slightly higher up, dogs, pigs, depending on, again, what you're looking at in therapeutic area. And those are more for safety. Before you go into man, we want to make sure we know where the products go. So we can't put radioactive you know, labels on molecules and give them to humans. You can't do what are called LD50s, which basically stand for lethal dose where 50% of uh, animals die. You can't do that in humans. So you do those early phase animal studies and look at just the movement of the molecule through a physiological system, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Why is that even acceptable that you can kill animals? That is a problem. And my answer to you just in general is, okay, are you willing to volunteer if it's never been tested? In anything except a Petri dish? No, but it's not acceptable to kill animals. They haven't done anything wrong. That is true. They, they don't deserve that. I mean, there are, you know, mice that are basically bred for clinical research. We have animal models of diseases. Yeah, I mean, I, I know most of the research is done on mice and all of that, but doesn't mean I have to like it. Nope, you don't have to like it. And I don't particularly like it either. But, and I will take strong stands over testing cosmetics on rabbits. But at some point, we're, I mean, we are developing new tools, but ultimately it comes down to, do we want drugs to be approved that were never tested? I mean, why not do it on humans that have terminal illnesses? Well, that's fine, but high blood pressure is not terminal. So how, you know, so how do you test a potential medication for high blood pressure using that argument? And truthfully, Having been the director of research and education at one of the largest hospices and palliative care centers in the nation for a while, I'll tell you that, you know, there's no guarantee in life. Hospice is not a death sentence. We used to joke, people do, you know, survive hospice and go home. You know, It's got criteria and there are definitely terminal illnesses, but truthfully, Sean, this is a conversation that is very personal. I do fundamentally agree with you. I love animals. I could not personally work on dogs or monkeys and things like that. But I also understand that we don't have an answer and I don't believe the world is ready to give up finding new cures for diseases like glioblastoma or for psychological illnesses, the same thing. So then with what you guys are working on, how are you planning on handling that? We are doing a transdermal development, which will be tested on skin, obviously, for irritation and things like that. The advantage with some of the plant medicine is that, you know, we do have a long history of safety. We're hoping we'll be able to utilize some of the uh, chemistry manufacturing and controls that have been developed by other companies. But we will have to do, we'll go in, we'll probably partner with UCSD here in town. We've met with quite a few people. They have a large psychedelic research center now and are beginning to run clinical trials on psilocybin and treatment-resistant depression. There's a really fascinating study, at least for me, because the, I can't say disease because it isn't. It's actually phantom limb pain which is just when you think about that, it's just so horrible in so many ways that if psilocybin could actually help, really amazing. You just have to put the patch where the, where the nerve endings are and it would maybe stimulate growth in a way. 
I don't know actually how it works. The way I like to explain it is they work on our neural connections in our brain and our, our neural connections are fluid. Some call it plasticity where, you know, they can change. And, you know, the best example to think about is if you know somebody who's ever had a stroke. So a mild stroke means you have killed some brain cells. And once your brain cells are killed, by the way, they don't come back. But we all know that stroke patients can recover. Say they were paralyzed on their left side. They can get some of that movement back. Why? Because they remap, if you will, and make new neural connections. There's talk therapy, psychotherapy, such as EMDR, that's based on reconnecting new neural pathways to deal with childhood trauma and things like that. So if you think about a psychedelic trip, you can imagine that the psilocybin breaks apart those neural connections and then follow on psychotherapy will reconnect them in a air quote, healthier way. I think there's a lot of potential with uh, neurogenesis and, and all of that. I think it's a very fascinating place. And my family is in a place that's kind of crappy because my mother had hepatitis C. She went through the Harvoni study and she was cured, but it was in her body for like 30 something years before it left her body. There is now research coming out, which says they're highly confident that long-term exposure to hepatitis C can cause brain damage and personality changes, which is what we've noticed. It's not a good change, let me put it that way. I'm sorry to hear that, yeah. And it's hard for her because she doesn't, like, she knows that something's different and she hates it because she doesn't feel whole. And it affects her on a daily basis in many ways. A lot of her executive functioning is has been compromised. It's hardest for us because we love her and you know she she used to be a superwoman she used to take us to like she didn't work you know for, she she didn't have her own career she she sacrificed you know the best parts of her life for us to to raise my brother and I taking us to school to karate you know here and there always making every meal and like, still having time to go and volunteer at our school and grade papers with the teachers and like you name it she was there for everything never complained always full of energy always on top of everything even paying all the bills and helping my dad with taxes and sometimes in his business and she can't do pretty much anything now yeah and she knows it yet doesn't understand it and can't fix it and i think those are really frustrating i feel like psilocybin or ketamine are potentially very helpful for her. But unfortunately, she's stuck on this antidepressant and traditional psychiatrist and psychologist. And I think that it's detrimental. I think it's hurting her, not helping her. And I would I would love for her to be in some sort of a trial where she could take ketamine or, or psilocybin on a long-term basis. You know, it's interesting because being on an antidepressant so far is an exclusionary criteria in probably all the clinical trials right now. Because you could have serotonin overload if you take both at the same time, yep. which is really interesting because when you look at the chemical formula of the psilocybin, it basically mirrors that of serotonin. So it's right. like an antidepressant with no ramp up, no withdrawals, no addictiveness, and no side effects. Yeah. Now there is some side effects, serious side effects that have emerged with psilocybin due to its binding to the 5-HT2B receptor. It's either the 2A receptor or the 2B receptor. And I've got a couple publications that I can share with you later, or Tyler can. And so we were on the phone with a researcher from back east who was talking about it. So it's not going to be without side effects. Unfortunately, nothing is. But when you compare the side effects of any of these psychedelics with the current treatment we have for mental illnesses, there's no comparison. Unfortunately, long-term we don't have, but we also do know that long-term treatment of schizophrenia, I mean, anybody who's been on a long-term SSRI or anything will start to tell you that they just, the side effects are numbness, I don't feel engaged, you know, it's, Yes, you don't have the lows, but you also don't have the highs. And that's what I hear people say. One of the biggest things I notice is lack of empathy from her. <laughs> and I, I can't tell if it's the personality change or it's if it's a side effect of the antidepressant. And unfortunately, taking people off antidepressants, it's, it's really tough. Sometimes I'd love to see these, some of these individuals who are on multiple therapeutics 
you know, you just keep adding them and then we don't have any studies, right? We don't have any studies with all these combinations. You just look at the elderly in general who are now on heart medication, high blood pressure medication, cholesterol lowering medication, and then they're depressed. So they put them on an antidepressant. We have no idea how those are all interacting. None whatsoever. Oh yeah. If you look at my grandma's pill box, she's got three pill boxes, some are in the morning, some are in the evening. She, she doesn't even know what half of them are. And there's like 30 different pills. Yeah. And that's crazy. And I would love to say, God, can't you just wean them off them all and then start clean? And maybe there's one thing that would help. There's a great study. I want to say it's out of UC Davis. That's literally shown a slightly different crisis, but the opioid overuse, you know, substance abuse diseases, uh, an opioid use that's shown that in areas where there's cannabis dispensaries, there's a lower incident of opioid use disorder. And it was just published. I mean, it's a, it's a great article. So there are other options and people are looking at botanical plant medicine for their medicinal potential benefits. And the reason I added all those words in it is because right now plant medicine is over the counter, which means you can't label it. So we're in that conundrum, if you will. And I think that if I can tread lightly here, I think there are benefits to seeing some of these products go through, yes, the very long and costly FDA approval process and get approved. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to cannabis as an example. The fact that we have Epidiolex approved for epilepsy gives all those people that have the legal right to grow marijuana, to smoke marijuana, to have a certain amount of cannabis in their possession, gives them the right to do that. And now they have scientific evidence that if their child has epilepsy, there could be a clear benefit and the child doesn't have to go into a clinical trial. They don't have to pay the money and get a prescription. They can grow their own plants and do it themselves. Mushrooms are actually easier than cannabis to grow. So you could have your humid room and grow your fungi. But right now what we're seeing is states and cities decriminalizing it. It's similar to how cannabis started, where mm. you know, you're know you not going to be thrown in jail. That's the first thing. Second, you can grow your own mushrooms and, and use them. What I'm seeing is that even though mushrooms are being decriminalized, I don't think there's going to be much recreational use in America. So like, for example, Oregon just passed a bill that makes it possible for someone to walk into a clinic, get psilocybin, mm -hmm. and have talk therapy. Correct. I think that's how psilocybin is going to go. I do too. I mean, do know that those clinics are not open and they're, you know, looking at 2023. Of by course. The time they get up, you know. So, but I agree. And I don't see the FDA, by the way, Sean, 100%. I don't see the FDA approving any of this that isn't in combination with some form of talk therapy. Because again, if you think about what these molecules are doing, if they're breaking away these neural connections, then if they just go back to the same place, what benefit is that? I'm curious to try therapy myself with it. I've been a psychologist to myself for as long as I've been able to. And I think being an entrepreneur and going through the pandemic and going through a divorce and dealing with my mom has put me in a spot where I, I think I kind of want to talk to someone. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it will be helpful. And I'm already microdosing, so it could be an interesting thing to try out for myself. So do you find a benefit from microdosing? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. In general, they help with uh, you know anxiety. And I think that's the biggest thing that I experience on a daily basis. I agree. And when you're not taking psilocybin at a macro dose, where let's just say you have the hallucinogenic experience, then it's really mild. And sometimes if you do it and then stop and think about, am I feeling anxious again? You know, give yourself those two weeks or so without, that's when people realize, oh, they were beneficial. Again, that you'll see the same scenario when you look at cannabis, high THC versus CBD alone. And one of the issues are that people want to feel something. And a lot of times when you take CBD, you don't feel anything until you step back and go, oh, I dealt with that pretty well. Because nothing, sorry, but nothing is going to take away the fact that life can be stressful and cause anxiety. You have to deal with your mother. My mom um, will be 92. And in spite of it, she's probably going to live for another five, 10 years. But 
all the frustration, you know, I want her here. So I just have to deal with it. Does it cause me anxiety? Yes. Does it frustrate the hell out of me sometimes? Yes. And so the question is, I can't make that go away. Can I benefit from CBD or microdosing and realize, oh, you know, it's just not, you know, pushing me over the edge anymore. You know, I can stand up there and do it. And I think, again, same thing, you can go all the way back to vitamins. If you ask anybody in your family or your friends, you say, hey, Sean, do you take a multivitamin? Sean says, yes, I do. And I say, and how does it make you feel? And you pause and go, I don't know. No change. Yeah. Now, if you stopped and say, you know, when I teach my nutrition class, I, I actually go through this walk. And if you stop it and then go, God, you know, I, I went out for a run today and I just feel like shit. Then, you know, you go into the, your physician, you get a blood test done and you find, lo and behold, I'm low on iron or I'm low on B12. Well, that vitamin supplement did help you. You didn't feel anything on a daily basis, but when you pushed yourself, you felt fine, but you didn't have that perspective of what it would have felt like when you weren't taking it. So it's those type of exercises that let us realize that we can benefit by, you know, making sure that our body is commiserate with wellness, that homeostasis is managed throughout our entire system and supplementing with, you know, vitamins, minerals, botanicals, over the counters. A lot of that helps, you know, us with our everyday wellness. And I'm only emphasizing that because I don't want to give your listeners the impression that if they have a serious illness, they shouldn't go to a doctor, get diagnosed, and hopefully have that physician lay out all the options, not just, you know, the prescription drug that they, you know. Oh, you're depressed. Here's some opioids. <laughs> right. Exactly. I think that humans and even chimpanzees and orangutans, all of these other, will and have picked these leaves that they found and, and kind of played around and figured out what does what. And I think that's why we have this collective unconscious uh, understanding of these different plants. And that's why our brains have the receptors that they do. I mean, people go, oh, this stuff is illegal. It's for a reason. But why does our brain have the ability to handle it? It's because we've been doing it for millions of years. <laughs> Well, in, you know, the discovery of the endocannabinoid system basically came out of Israel because a scientist said, I'm going to learn how THC does what it does. Great scientific question, right? THC is a phytocannabinoid. It's from the cannabis plant. So he goes about it. His lab does work. And they start testing it. And they go, well, why do vertebrate animals have receptors for THC? I mean, THC is a plant molecule. What are humans doing with a receptor? And from there, we learned about the endocannabinoid system. In fact, we have an endo, meaning endogenous, an endocannabinoid called anatomide that THC mimics. Okay, so the molecule in the plant mimics a cannabinoid that we produce endogenously. And what's really even more strange is anatomide in Sanskrit means bliss. So that wonderful high that people got that felt wonderful and relaxed actually is a result of anatomide, which we produce and have receptors in our central nervous system that it binds and it means bliss. I always love that story. From what I remember, the first known account of marijuana use was by a Chinese doctor like six or 7,000 years ago. There's a few books out there that trace it back forever. And, you know, peyote and all, you know, mushrooms and psychedelics. I mean, those have been around for, you know, eons. Exactly. So I just, I'm talking about this more and I'm going to continue to sound the alarms and scream from the rooftops for people like this stuff is not bad for us. And we shouldn't be ashamed about it. Our ancestors used it for eons. There's no reason for us not to understand ourselves better and explore these things, especially when it could possibly make being an entrepreneur a much more enjoyable experience. That's right. Uh, spoken like a true entrepreneur. No, you know, you're absolutely right. And I agree with you. I, I don't actually like the word recreational. I always say, you know, we don't have recreational alcohol. I think alcohol should be illegal. I would rather see alcohol illegal than, than, you know, psychedelics and stuff like that and cannabis. But I do believe in adult use and that you should be over 21 or whatever, whatever, whatever parameters there are in, at a 
point where you can make an autonomous and knowledgeable decision. But all that said, I, I agree with you. I don't see adult use psychedelics quite yet. Which is a shame. Which is a shame. But I do see the same pattern we had with cannabis, the cart getting before the horse. So again, we're going to be faced with the fact, especially microdosing. I'm old. I know a ton of people that microdose. I mean, I really do. And, you know, sometimes I go, so who's making these gummies? How are they doing that when it is so illegal? There's gummies for psilocybin. People are making them. They're out and about. And when it comes to cannabis, you know, we know that the black market is still alive and well. There's a thriving market where people are getting a medical marijuana card legally and then going and buying it and then selling it to people who don't have the card. Black market's alive and well. <laughs> you know, those people either don't want to get the card, they don't want to pay for the card, they don't want their name on some sort of list. Who knows? I'm not an advocate of governing based on potential abuse. I'm convinced that people will find a way around a lot of people. People will find a way to abuse. Yes, they will. You know, like it or not, we just don't want it to become, you know, the standard. I've never macrodosed. I'm curious, but... I don't feel psychologically that I'm strong enough for it. I feel like right. I might fight back when it becomes challenging. And I, I don't want to put myself in that situation. So I feel like microdoses are what I'm comfortable with. And I want to be able to take them and work. Right. And macrodosing, you would have to do in the presence of, right now it's in the presence of a therapist, a physician, you know, somebody that's overseeing that, that trip. Now, you want to go back to the 60s, that's a whole different time. My parents tell me about it all the time. Yeah, then they didn't live it. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have heard that expression, you know. If you remember the 60s, you didn't live the 60s. Fair enough. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we didn't actually talk about clinical stuff much, but I think we, we touched on some higher level mm -hmm. topics and I think that it's still a pretty good outcome so maybe I'll have you come back another time to actually talk about the clinical side yeah I mean we talked a little bit You're, we talked around it all you know but I think we made some good points about the role of clinical trials and the questions that the FDA is looking for in terms of, of their requirements so how can people follow up with you they can email me at lynda at silly p-s-l-y dot com one thing I, I'm curious about, a lot of college courses are like free to view online now and you're doing this nutrition course. Is that something people can access or? They can, they can email me at lstrauss at ucsd.edu. I don't think the university hosts courses online for free. And yes, I'm teaching remotely. However, I am very happy to say that I'm walking back into the classroom on Monday. So there you nice. go. Yes, I'm very excited to see all those young exciting minds, just sponges waiting to learn. Well, the reason I asked is because I recently decided I want to learn everything I can about nutrition and food science. I already think I know a good bit about food, uh, nutrition because I have lost about 55 pounds this year, oh, the last year. But that really isn't nutrition per se. It's because I started to learn what nutrition actually is and what I should be eating and how, like I, I learned all of the those kinds of things. But I still think there's a lot more to learn. And I think food science is a really important part of it because cooking your food and how you cook it and, and how you prepare things like that can expand your mind. So I've, I've been looking for ways to learn more about nutrition and food science. I will check that out. I My course is really biochemistry and physiology from the perspective of foods. It is a non-major course. So my students um, are not science majors. And I do teach them science because... That is what nutrition is. It's how our bodies handle foods and how we use them and why, you know, choices our cells make and supply and demand and all this fun stuff. So I actually teach a little bit of chemistry. I go through, unlike most nutrition courses, which teach the GI tract, I teach the GI tract, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the kidney, and by the way, the endocannabinoid system, because it's all about maintaining um, homeostasis, and that is our global modulator. And then, of course, people go, well, don't you talk about vitamins and minerals? And I go, yeah, they're relatively boring, but we talk about vitamins and minerals. I do a whole lecture on exercise. In fact, with the start of the pandemic and having spent two years doing this remotely, I actually have a colleague give a lecture on nutrition and mental health. And I actually had students email me and thank me. We talk about eating disorders. We talk about nutrition and disease. So I will be happy to share whatever with you. 
I ended up with a short-term eating disorder because of the pandemic and stress from my company. And that's how I gained the weight, accelerated the weight gain. And then I was like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 hold on, stop. And then I figured out what it was. I was like, oh shit, this is stress. This is stress. Oh, stress is amazing. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought maybe my blood sugar is off. I went to many doctors in Vietnam. I couldn't figure out what it was. And then eventually I had to take a hard look at myself and went, this is just stress. Like, I'm fine. And people manifest stress in different ways. I lost a phenomenal amount of weight over those two years. And, you know, my sons moved home. I had more food in my house than I have ever had in my entire life. People cooked for me. I ate. I did everything that should have maintained health. But that constant chronic stress just really took its toll. I was getting these headaches and dizziness and all sorts of things. And so when I realized it was stress, I was like, I'm doing that to myself? Exactly. I was like, oh, maybe I need to eat. Maybe I haven't eaten enough calories. Like I was, I was rationalizing and the eating made me feel better and made those things go away. And so I kept doing it. And before I knew it, I went from like 175 to 200 in a short span of time. Now, granted, I was, I shouldn't have already been 175. I'm only 5'6". So once I got a handle on that, which was about a year ago, it was about the time that my wife filed for divorce. So funny enough, about that time, I kind of put all that stuff together. And then I was able to get a hold of, or get a handle on my eating. And then I started to change a lot of different things and, and exercise uh, very heavily. And I was able to lose the 50 pounds. And it is a combination of, of diet and exercise, not one or the other. You need them both. I want to kill my dad. He's so annoying about this because he's like, oh, well, I'm not gaining any weight. He's 5'9", 205 pounds. He has a donut around him, around his core. Yeah. It's, and he doesn't really eat anything. He like barely consumes anything. But he doesn't exercise. And what he does consume consists partly of alcohol every day. And I keep telling him, if you don't stand up and go for a walk, you'll never get under 200 pounds. Even if you eat zero calories and starve yourself, if you keep consuming alcohol and don't exercise, you'll never get under 200. The way you need to tell him is what you have to do, you have to stay away from the scale mentality and talk about body composition. As long as your body composition is high in body fat, you will store. That's what fat does. It stores. That's its purpose. And that's what it does. Lean muscle mass, basically the counter to your percent body fat is the percent lean muscle mass. Lean muscle mass is a metabolically active tissue. So it will burn those calories. So it's true that anorexic who starves themselves says, I eat an apple to the doctor and I gain weight. And the doctor goes, well, yeah, your body goes, oh my God, food, store it quick because I'm not going to have any, you know. So you've developed this, this system where we want to survive. So you actually lower your metabolic rate the higher your percent body fat is, the lower your metabolic rate is. So you actually can't eat a lot. I always say, you know, the more lean muscle mass allows you to eat calories commiserate with nutrient value that we have to get. So you end up fighting a losing battle. You can't get the nutrients you want with low enough calories because your body composition is high percent body fat versus a higher percent lean muscle mass. The one thing we know exercise does is increase lean muscle mass. I keep telling him, but he's like, oh, you know, like I can't go to the gym because of, you know, Omicron. And I was like, yeah, whatever, fine. But like, you can go outside for a walk, go walk for an hour. And right. he, he'd rather just, he'd rather not. So what, what he was saying when he was going to the gym was, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to exercise there. And when I see the fat coming off my extremities, then like I'll be enticed to go for walks. And I was like, that's not how it works. You have to go for walks now if you want to see the fat come off your extremities. Yes, you have to do it both. And it is a problem. The heavier we are, the, the less we feel like moving, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it becomes a losing battle. It is true that the heavier you are, you know, actually the more calories you burn because you have more body mass. But you have to get out. You have to start slow. And there's always time to take a walk, especially in our mobile day. Put your buds in and go take your call, you know, while you're walking around. All right. So th thank you very much for your time, Linda. I really appreciate it. And it if you like this episode, definitely reach out to her. Um, if you're curious about psychedelics, reach out to her. So don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. 
to take care of yourself every day and don't feel afraid of things you don't understand because they might be able to help. Thank you, Linda. You're very welcome. Thank you, Sean. 